title of the, of the presentation, Achieving a Public Key Infrastructure is uh, as good a title as any, being that public key infrastructure is uh, truly an emerging rather than a merged technology and how we actually, uh, or what we actually end up with in the final structure, if you will, is, is still yet to be determined. Although there is some ideas on, on where we think we need to go. What is the requirement? Why are we going down the path of a public key infrastructure? Secretary Cohen has made it very clear that uh, we are required to protect the information that is transiting the, depart the, the DII, Defense Information Infrastructure. Along those lines, not only protect it, but make sure that uh, it arrives with integrity and people participating can participate with uh, non repudiation in a non repudiation type fashion such that uh, we can assure that their participation or they cannot deny uh, participating in those types of events. There's also been a couple other memorandums from the Deputy Secretary, Dr. Hamry, and the, the uh, ASDCQ guy, Tony Valletta, that have clearly outlined that public key infrastructure or a public key technology is going to be utilized in protecting the information, particularly in the SBU world, since it's an unclassified world, and uh, specifically they mandated that uh, they use it to do digital signatures for the defense travel system. The defense travel system pilot will be in defense travel system region six, which is in the center part of the country, which has only two Navy bases. So from a Navy, Naval perspective, Navy Marine Corps team, uh, there's only two organizations that are, will be participating in that pilot, and that is Crane, Indiana, and, and Great Lakes. We have other organizations that are doing pilots, uh, NAV Air, NAV C, NAV SUP, Spay War, uh, NCTS Pensacola. So there's a whole bunch of other organizations that are also testing different technologies in the public, in, in the public key area. Why, uh, one of the reasons that you need to think about why public key, you have to look at the sensitivity of the information you're passing. Is the information classified? Right now, we'll talk only about sensitive but unclassified, but uh, there is, that discussion is ongoing about whether this a commercially off-the-shelf technology could be used to add a layer of defense in even the classified realm. So, that is under discussion. That's why there's a question mark after classified as to whether we're going to use it there or not. Mission critical or command and control criticality of information once again. Um, electronic commerce, large dollar value. The, lar the dollar value associated with that right now has been set by DISA at $100,000, uh, but there's no magic to that number. Uh, and, and the thought process area is what is a large dollar value that would cause the sensitivity of the information to be such that it could do that significant harm if uh, the system was compromised in one way, shape, or form. Personnel information. Personnel information has sensitivity associated with it. Uh, name, social security number, um, bank accounts in the, form, in, the, in the case of travel. Everything we're doing now is electronically deposited, so that could be another uh, sensitivity information, as well as just uh, fitness reports and those types of things that would be passed back and forth electronically, uh, you wouldn't, particularly if they're adverse, wouldn't want that information to be uh, publicly available. And we are required by law to protect some types of information. Specifically, uh, medical, medical information we're required by law in a lot of cases to protect. Uh, and there's some other legal information such that, the, for instance, the JAG guys and gals that are passing information back and forth required by law to protect you know, the sensitivity of the, the, the content of that information that we're passing back and forth. Who's the threat? What are we protecting against? Hostile intelligence agencies, insiders, hackers, industrial espionage from the standpoint of we pass information back and forth, business sensitive, business proprietary information with some of our defense contractors that's fairly sensitive uh, and, and might be uh, there, there could be significant gain made by other companies or other contractors if they were to intercept that information. Uh, one bullet that's, uh, that, that's not up there is also commercial exploitation. If you actually get into the uh, 
exploiting commercial markets, the ability for me to uh, say the spyware contracting officer signed a document that said he was going to obligate a you know, three hundred thousand dollars to our company to do a task when that action never actually happened, or transferring of information, or excuse me, transferring of finances from one organization that has dollars in their coffers to a bank account that might be fictitious or fraudulent in one way, shape, or form. What services will a public key infrastructure once achieved provide? It'll provide INA, identification, authentication, confidentiality, um, non-repudiation, integrity of information, such that the information we know can't be changed as it's uh, transiting the pipes. And the pipes I'm talking about here are, are really intra and internet network systems. Um, privilege and authorization, basically access control. What you're talking about there is access control. What type of access does a person have? Not everybody in your organization is going to have the need um, or should have the ability to sign documents that obligate your organization for financial uh, obligations such as warrant authority uh, to sign you up to, to perform or obligate certain money to, to another organization for providing services, as well as uh, uh, granting you access to certain types of information. You can use the example if you get into the classified realm of compartment, compartmentization of information or need to know um, in a specific network. For instance, if you are on the SIPRNET today, you're on the SIPRNET. There is no INA on the SIPRNET. There's no need to know um, segregation on the SIPRNET. So if, if a system uh, were implemented, you should be able to provide those types of services on a network. A little bit about definitions. Public key infrastructure is a subset of a couple other larger infrastructures, and that is key management infrastructure, which not only includes uh, the generation, production, distribution, and tracking of commercially available COX-based solutions or public-private key pair solutions, but also in the symmetric key world. And then your SMI, your security management infrastructure, uh, which also includes the, the audit, intrusion detection, the whole um, security management uh, infrastructure of, of DOD. Historically, we'll, we talk a little bit about technical and non-technical security controls. This list is not designed or uh, thought of to be all-inclusive. I didn't try to capture every single one of the controls here. But these are just some examples of what you'll hear uh, in the non-technical and technical control arena. Uh, from a non-technical perspective, what you're looking at is physical, procedural, and personal. Physical is built, building and room. There's also some, some of these are, that are applicable to a public key infrastructure that you implement. For instance, once you start generating certificates, a certificate is basically a, a trust relationship that's set up. You do have to have a certain amount of these type of technical and non-technical security controls at your, at your central point that issues those certificates. So not only are these historic in nature, but they're also applicable to what we're trying to accomplish within the uh, and procedural and personal. On the technical side, algorithm strengths, operating system strengths, auditing, and in a formal evaluation process that gets into uh, uh, what NIST and NIAP, NIST and NIAP are doing so, um, as evaluating the products to make sure they are viable products <coughs> to, to, to utilize within a federal organization. One of the things that I, that I didn't list up there is what's called the FIPS, Federal Information uh, Processing. It's a standards-based um, solution. In 19, I think when the mandate came out, I think it was 95, I could be wrong, I don't remember the exact date, but they mandated basically any, any InfoSec products that you're using have to be FIPS compliant. Um, and so in, in the public key infrastructure side, if you look at the Cox-based solutions, there's a couple of them that are on there right now. Uh, the Netscape products are on there, the Intrust products are on there, uh, and I think GTE CyberTrust is on there from a commercially available list of products. And there's several others that are uh, claim that they're fixed compliant, but uh, haven't quite made the list. I did 
cover a little bit of this before. Um, the definition of PKI, the second half of that, I think I've, I've talked about mostly, and that is authentication and proof, the proof that the, the sender is who they say they are, non remediation the ability not to be able to refute participating in an event. That we actually have integrity, that the information hasn't been changed in one way, shape, or form um, as it transits into pipes and in confidentiality. The person who we wanted to get the message is really the person who received it. Public key is actually the total system is in, in the process of generation, uh, distribution, management, and, and subsequently revoking if you get to that, and that's all part of the management scheme of keys. So it really is talking about keys. What keys am I talking about? I'm talking about a public and a private key pair that's generated by a user who is whose identity has been verified by a, by a local authority and has the need to have a certificate to participate in this process. I'll go over that process here in actually how the process physically generates these keys in just a couple of minutes. A public key is one that is available, hosted in a publicly available domain. Right now the thought process is that that will be <coughs> in, a, in a directory type structure such that you will have available to anybody in the public anybody who is participating in the process is key. If, I, if Cynthia was trusted and she had a public key, I could uh, basically, and I wanted to send her a, a, an email, a secure message, uh, my system would go out and get her public key. It would encrypt the message that I am sending to her uh, such that the only way she would be able to decrypt that would be with her own personal private key gets me over to the private key side, and that is it's protected, it's, it's generated at the machine the way the existing uh, products go. It's generated at the machine, it's available only to the user, assuming that they don't compromise it with, with somebody. Um, it is escrow, the current, current products escrow it either on the hard drive or on the disk. Future products will escrow it by the actual uh, uh, generation package. It is used to digitally sign documents as well as decrypt your uh, mail that's coming to you. One of the problems associated with public-private key pairs is it's 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 slow. Yeah. Sir, could you explain what you mean by that? Uh, I understand the escrow to disk, um, mm -hmm. either a floppy or a hard drive, but you said future products escrow it how? Uh, they'll escrow it in the actual uh, in the actual package, so it'll probably be at the server level. Be escrowed by the. It won't be the individual responsibility of the person, the end user, to do that. The key will automatically be escrowed at the, at the command level instead of at the user level. And so, how will the user associate himself with the key? He will no longer have a, the a physical thing to hold. So, how does he access his keys and identify himself with the key? Because he signed on as a said user. Okay, so then the key control is then a password control issue. Can be. Yeah, that, that's, the, you're saying key control being password control, what do you... Uh, well, I, how would you access your private key? Through your, an individual password on the system, right? Is that that's correct. So then your private key is protected only by your individual password? Um, that's correct. That's that's my understanding of it right now, yeah. Wouldn't that be a less secure? Depends. That's, that's if, if, well, it could be. Yes, it could be. Um, it, it depends on where it's resident. Is it resident on a token or is it resident on the network? Anytime it's resident on a token, it's more secure than it is resident, whatever that token may be, it's more secure than if it's resident on the network. So, and, and another thought that's being kicked around is um, smart cards. And, and being the fact that we're going, that smart cards are becoming very cheap. And uh, most of the keyboards that we're buying today have readers built into the, a lot of them anyway built into the keyboard so it's not that difficult a problem or a costly problem. That's another place to escrow the key. Key management is one of the harder things to, one of the more difficult things you have to work through. But you foresee a movement 
movement towards, uh, away from the token-based escrow towards uh, some type of CISR-based escrow in the commercial side because that's easier and therefore it would be, um, be less, less costly. Okay, when you, when, when, when you say the commercial side, you're talking about, for instance, banks, insurance agencies, or is that what you're well, saying? Well, I just mean the, 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 products. the products are going to be cost-based. Mm -hmm. And is that what you were trying to say, that the cost-based future of public key infrastructure is going to be moving away from a token-based storage of the key uh, towards a network-based storage? Correct. But at least that's that's the, that's the read right now. That's not to say that uh, if we think that that might not be acceptable from a security perspective, that we can't change, we can't change that. But that's that's the thought right now. Talked a little bit about certificate. What is a certificate? It is five on X509 V3 is is the standard that the commercially available products, as well as um, your high assurance for Tesla, <coughs> excuse me, for Tesla products are using. Cryptographically binds an identity with a with a public key, and it's really just a uh, it, it just does just that. It, it's it's an identity certificate. Now, there's a lot of discussion as to should it be more than a certificate, um, but but the feeling right now is that's where it's going to stay, and uh, we're not going to try to do any any access control or any privilege type information off of a certificate, but rather that's going to be done more at the uh, at the server level, and that's a discussion that we could have um, after the brief if anybody wants to get into that, but that's a, a fairly lengthy discussion. Right now, we don't think that technically we can do all of our access-based control from one central spot. Uh, some folks, at least that's, when you talk to Cynthia, that's our feeling. That's not to say that there is technically smart people out there that don't think or haven't expressed their opinion that they say they can do it. So, another topic for discussion. Certificate key management functions, I've talked about those. Generation, distribution, revocation, um, archive key recovery, which is what you're uh, you're talking about, um, and then something in the future, timestamp notary that that some folks have expressed they need or a requirement to have the timestamp of key. There's a couple things, a couple other things to talk about with respect to certificates. How do we generate them? They're generated, right now the thought from a DOD perspective is they're going to be generated by central organizations. Central organizations in this case being DISA. Um, in this case specifically being at two defense mega centers, Chambersburg and Denver. Those two certificate authorities will be certified by the root authority at Pinksburg, NSA. their responsibility, I'll talk about in a little bit, but that's basically to, to verify the request is valid and then to issue a certificate from there. And then that certificate gets passed to the, uh, gets posted in, in, in a public place so that any, anybody that has a need to look at that certificate can. Um, the bottom one is the one we just talked about a little bit, and that is it's only a user identity. We had a Navy workshop about uh, two weeks ago where we tried to get the people that are doing these pilots in a room to sit and talk through what we thought should be on a digital certificate. And there was a lot of uh, discussion about trying to do access control from that level. Um, but what it boiled down to is what should be on the certificate is, at least our initial thoughts right now, are identity and then also nationality. And the reason nationality was put on there is because it doesn't change, um, or it, it would be very, very infrequent that it would change. And it's, it's critical to, to performing uh, a certain, certain things that some of the organizations that were doing pilots needed to perform. For instance, uh, there was a lot of no foreign information that the folks were trying to control. Well, of course, what comes up when you make that type of statement is, well, you're doing access control, which you just told me you didn't want to do on the certificates uh, by saying, by including nationality in there. 
That's true, to a certain extent. But what the, the remainder of the types of access control that I'm talking about are the warrant authority trying to sign documents, um, access to certain types of information, access to certain applications, access to certain personnel information, access to financial information. So not necessarily uh, the, the rule-based or function-based thing, but just overall what the uh, nationality is in, in a lot of ways viewed as uh, part of the identity of the individual who, who possesses the certificate. What are the actual fields available on a, on a certificate? Um, pretty straightforward. One of the things that uh, um, we're wrestling with right now is, is over in your extensions. And, and that's where you get into possibly utilizing the nationality as an extension here. And uh, when you start talking about flipping the criticality flag, if you, if you make something critical, that means the certificate absolutely has to have that field filled in. And it has to be, when you fill it in, it has to be recognized. That's that's a difficult uh, uh, that's a difficult thing. It wouldn't seem like it is, but different products, commercially available products, have dealt with that in a certain way. So uh, we're still wrestling with whether that's actually going to be something that we're going to be able to utilize um, in the, in the, utilizing the criticality flag. In order talked a bit about digital signatures and uh, certificates. This is just another way of, uh, of looking at uh, the person sending the information is who they claim to be, the person receiving the information uh, is the intended recipient and this data has not been tampered with. Just another method of doing that in which one of the functions provides a digital signature encryption. And that, those are the two things that we're really talking about here. Being able to digitally sign something, being able to encrypt the information. Architecture. A generic architecture. Uh, what does that look like? If you have a user who has a need to digitally sign or protect uh, or encrypt some information, is that he or she, is that a command that has authorization to say that these people are who they say they are. What do I mean by that? I wouldn't want anybody in this room to be able to go to DISA and say, I represent an organization, spoofing that organization, and say, I need digital certificates for the following folks. How do you prevent that? You, you, you put a person in the middle, to a certain extent, that's called the registration their responsibility is going out and verifying that the local registration authorities who are requesting certificates of the certificate authority is valid. They're a valid Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, in those organizations command, and that yes, they have a need to have certificates to perform some of these functions. Then it's the legwork exists at the local registration authority to, to say that I, Mark Burbach, am Mark Burbach by presenting military ID or presenting some type of um, photo or a couple different forms of identification. That's going to be dependent upon what the people want as their span of control to stand up that local registration authority. Local registration authority span of control could be um, 50, it could be 500. There's, there's the school still out on exactly how big that should be. Command level is what we're thinking right now. So I go ask them for to, for them to get me a certificate. They say, "Fine, you are who you say you are." That request goes to the CA certification authority from the central location, DOD, DISA, and uh, and my request also goes and says, I, "I need I need a certificate." They come back with uh, they come back with my certificate. This is a one time password one-time password given from the uh, from the LRA. I use that one-time password to go out and talk to uh, talk to the central organization. They issue me a certificate, send that back, and um, I can generate my public-private key. 
I have a key pair is kept by myself, as I talked about before. Public key pair is posted back here to a central uh, directory structure. Is there a question? Um, is the command level what? What level of command are you talking about? Depends on what your what you want your span of control to be with respect to verifying people. What I mean, what you're are you around right now? Well, uh, from from a spare work perspective, let's use spare work as an example. Headquarters is about 400 people. Is is that too is that too large an organization? Could I do it at the personnel office when you have people check in? Um, do you delegate that down to managers within individual program offices? You can use a squadron level. Um, you can use a uh, you know do you want it at down at the unit level at the ship level or do you want it to be uh, at the squadron level? From a ship perspective, I think it's probably pretty but from a shore-based activity, it's, it's a little bit, a little bit squishier. How big, how large do you want that span of control? To be? Those are the ideas we're getting. Around. But the fleet needs to weigh in on that. That's we're not going to tell them how. We're not, we're not trying to tell somebody how they should be setting that up. They can have as many LRAs as they want. That's, that, but that's where the work, a lot of the legwork is done. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. NSA and NIST right now have been saying, at least on the commercial side, that with the whole clipper chip the whole, um, proposal, that they want to have key escrow. Uh, but your model here doesn't allow for that kind of increase. I know I'm not seeing it. Is that something that is important to you as, a, as set up in advance? It's one of the things that you have to have a system that allows for key escrow for the private keys? We have to have the ability to escrow private keys. Absolutely. And, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, first of all, it's government information that you're, that you're utilizing, you're passing back and forth. The government is adamant about that. Um, some people in uh, ACLU or other folks don't like that, but that's tough. Uh, this is government information. So where, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there, there's another reason, and that is if you do turnover or you, you die or whatever, you die or whatever, you've got to be able to decrypt that information. So, so yes, that is possible. Uh, that is mandatory that we actually How does that work into this? Here at your private key. And right. how, you, how you're protecting that private key. That's the discussion we just had before. It's the how, you're, how you're actually going to protect that private key and how's it going to be escrowed. But, but even if you escrow it in a token locally, um, you need to have some. I was wondering who holds the other key. Your LRA will have to hold that. It's the only way you can do it. You've got to have a central organization that holds those. Even if you escrow it on a disk, you have to have somebody that has access to that disk and knows what that disk is in order to be able to get the information. So does that LRA, uh, when you do the initial exchange, uh, how does that work in terms of the... You, you, would have to generate, you would have to generate your private key, and then you would have to give the LRA a copy of your private key. Uh, have they thought about it the other way, where the LRA generates both keys? And tells you what your private key is, and then the problem with that is now you know, how how are they going to tell you that? The only person that should have access, well, I mean, yeah, you could you could do that, but if you get an organization that has five, seven hundred people, mm -hmm. generation of keys for for that type of that size of organization can be cumbersome. How is that problem more more difficult than the LRA having to store those keys anyway? Because all I'm doing is giving you a disk. Telling you what the password is when you store it safe. It's a lot more manpower intensive to generate keys than it is to, to just store them and say, generate and manage. Um, quick question about the, the rest of the picture. Is the protocol on that picture not fully described? Uh, because it would seem to me that the binding of the user's key to the certificate, uh, as depicted, is not uh, very strong. Uh, and that there's some certificate authority keys that are being sent to the user to provide for that binding as he's sending it back. Um, in case somebody grabs it on the web and inserts something else. Or the, reuses his certificate or whatever. The, the only thing that's centrally sent on the air is the public key, which is going to be publicly available. Is the binding of the public key to the certificate? That's correct. Bind it, for example, with a key from the certificate authority, a CA public key, um, so that only the CA could do the unbinding. 
That's that that is the way it's currently done. Now, what product uh, what protocols used well, to do that? I don't know the answer to that. Suggesting that the protocol shown in the picture is a little bit. Um, it's not all shown. Okay. In the picture. Yeah, it's probably not probably not shown correctly from the standpoint well, of. Um, there's a lot more going on. Yeah, there is. There, and, and the only person that can do that by me is the CEO. And which protocol that's from? This is a tough topic, certification revocation list. Why it's a tough topic is um, in disadvantaged users such as fleet or deployed forces, um, how often do you want them to check uh, a CRL to make sure they actually have certificates that are valid? It's easy on non-constrained terrestrial connectivity where you can first of all have time to wait, second of all you have to Bandwidth. That is oftentimes viewed as unlimited. So um, it is a list that needs to be maintained centrally because we're going to be communicating across organizations, across services, across agencies. So it has to be a central repository, if you will. Frequency of update is an issue. Okay, how? What I mean by the frequency of update is how often is that central list updated? Um, and then also the second issue there is how often do you or procedurally are we required to check that before we actually do a communications with somebody uh, with certificates. And you can get input from any trusted source. If I lose my certificate, it's my responsibility to not only tell my LRA, but to tell the CA that, hey, I've comp I have a possible, not lose my certificate, that was a, a misstatement there, but if my private key is compromised, I have an obligation to tell somebody that that happened certificate can be revoked that binds my public key, which is generated as a key pair, to that certificate. You can revoke the certificate so nobody can, can utilize that. It's also the LRA's responsibility, local registration authorities, as well as the, the R. This is a just a problem with the existing product that uh, we're using right now, the Netscape product. The reason we're using Netscape is because DOD has a contract with Netscape to, to utilize their commercially available product. Uh, via DISA and NSA. Um, right now, the uh, certification revocation list never gets aged off. So you have, you put a certification revocation list out, and that stays on the system, and the next one you put out builds on top of that, and the next one builds on top of that. So that's just a bug we have to, we have to get fixed. And, and the bottom statement there is, uh, with, re with relationship to how often do you want the CRL updated, and how often do you, as, as a user, want to or think you need to check the list against the actual people you're communicating with to make sure they're still valid and what's your threshold of pain or what's your, what's your risk associated with it. That leads me into what some of the functional responsibilities are besides certification or location list. Um, CAs, certification authorities, are actually responsible for represent, uh, accuracy representations. <coughs> ultimately, they're the ones that are issuing your certificates, so ultimately, they're the ones that are responsible for that. Um, they're responsible for notifying the end users that their certificates have been issued, um, notifying uh, everybody about revocation and suspension via certification revocation list, and uh, they maintain certificate, certificate information as well as operate and maintain a help desk. And that, uh, that can prove to be critical because when you start issuing certificates to a multitude of users, there's going to be people with certificate problems, and they need a central organization that they can go to. So, the certification authority and registration authority the same thing? No, they're not. Registration authority, his responsibility is to certify the local registration authorities. This will be AIDS one or two organizations within Navy. Remember the architecture picture, he kind of sat up off to the side and only had an arrow uh, really to the LRAs to certify the local registration authorities. Um, and, and that's to say that he, that once again, responsible that their information is accurately represented and, uh, and also to be, be timely in, in the process of the LRA responses because we want the system, we're trying to do this electronically, so we want the system to be as responsive as we can to, uh, to our requests. Is there any speculation as to who the uh, registration authorities might be at this point? Yes, ma'am. Right now, for Navy, that's going to be 
owns one organization right now, and that's going to be DCMS. If the, if the DOD structure that I put up there before withstands uh, the scrutiny of the services and, and agencies, and this does all the functions centrally, the, R, the Navy RA, and obviously there will have to be a backup. We haven't thought that through yet completely, but the Navy RA will be DCMS. They do all the key management for Navy right now, so that's a, we think, a smart place to put them. And then the LRAs will be at whatever level we decide. LRAs, there's a lot, here's where a lot of the legwork's done, verifying that the individual user is who they say they are, um, verifying that they have a need, they have a certificate issued, and then notification of, uh, once again, they're also responsible for notification if the person falls out of favor, um, is deceased, or transfers to the command, and no longer requires it from their specific um, LRA. I talked a little bit about levels of assurance it's important to understand most of the talk that I've given so far is focused on the commercially available products. It's also important to understand that there is a high level of public infrastructure insurance. That's for Tesla, at least right now, thought of as for Tesla. Um, and that's for electronic commerce. Over 100,000 bucks, classified information, and uh, your organizational message. So this uh, infrastructure will work for classified information as well? Yes, it will. Just like uh, SuperNet, all that will work. Yes, it will. More than anything else, it's getting NSA to, I mean, I could use the commercially available stuff on SuperNet if I could get a uh, certification, somebody to certify this, the products that we could actually use them for classified information. There's real hesitancy uh, for utilizing commercially available product that's free to anybody that you can download off of Netscape Communicator and to use that to protect or what would be perceived as protecting um, classified information. You're not really protecting the information because the information is protected right now by some symmetric bulk encryption devices that are, that are and all the other security devices, firewalls, guards. So this will be on top of that's correct. That would be that would be I, what you're really providing is I and A and need to know type services on those individual dedicated networks. Digital signatures. Um, I think I've talked through most of what I uh, uh, what I need to talk about here. Important to understand that um, your document is hashed, and, and, and in that uh, that hash is encrypted such that if any one figure in that hash changes, basically invalidates your signature. The algorithms associated with digital signatures, um, it's been mandated that digital signature <coughs> standard DSS will be the algorithm that will be used if we're communicating within DOD, and that our system be adaptable enough such that we can use commercially available algorithms, such as RSA, if we're communicating outside of The example of, of uh, utilizing encryption and digital signature, I've talked through this. Okay. I have talked through most of that, uh, the examples I've used to basically say if, if you want to encrypt something, you go out and get somebody else's public key, you encrypt it. You get it from the directory services, they get it, they decrypt it with their private key. To sign it, you sign it with your private key, send it to them, they go back to the directory service to get your public key to make sure that it's actually decrypted. along the algorithm vein again, key exchange algorithms. If we're communicating within DOD, KEA is the algorithm that we're, we're mandated to use. Outside of DOD, our system once again has to be uh, adaptable enough so we use commercial algorithms such as RSA or Bitcoin. Big concern is interoperability between products. It, there's commercially, all of these products use 509B3 certificates. So you would think that they, they'd be interchangeable, but not necessarily. There's some commercial isms associated with each one of the products that we're concerned about. Um, we're concerned about on how you're doing actual path validation, how you're doing, what the impact's gonna be on the infrastructure. 
and particularly on bandwidth, how, how we're going to impact bandwidth uh, from a fleet user perspective. What's the impact on the in infrastructure from a terrestrial perspective is a little bit of overhead on what you're using, but not, not as difficult a problem as it is to the end user. And the big one there, it has to be easy to use. If the boss can't use it, if the boss can't go, if he's got to go through five or six machinations to get to the point where he's had to encrypt his email, he's probably just going to send it the way he's sending it right now, and that's not encrypted. <coughs> so it has to be transparent to him, this convoluted process that I've um, hopefully described so you can understand. It has to be transparent to the end user. He has to go to a key and say encrypt, go to the next key and say sign, hit the send button and have a good confidence level that his message is encrypted, it's signed, and who he wants to get that message has got. Another big issue that's going to impact our uh, architecture is cross-certification. Where this is important is um, <clears throat> talking with the commercial sector. We want to talk to Boeing, pass information back and forth with Boeing. We need to be able to trust their organization. In order to trust them, we have to cross-certify with them. Okay, so how we actually do that cross-certification process is, is a difficult problem. DISA has sent uh, uh, the services away and said, we're not sure how we're going to do cross-certification yet. But we went back to them and said, if you're not sure how you're going to do cross-certification, you can't be sure how you're going to have your infrastructure set up. Until we wrestle with wrestle this problem completely to ground, um, we can only speculate that we're going to have a top level um, CA, and there might be some other unit level or, or major claimant level CAs that have to have um, special capabilities, if you will, to cross certify some commercial organizations. So that's what we're thinking. Can we put a proof like this one? If somebody wanted to do that? Well, you've got to get somebody's going to have to certify that. The, other organizations. That's the biggest, that's the toughest problem. If I if I send an RFP out in Spadeware, I get 40 or 50 RFP or a press for proposal on a contract. I get 40 or 50 people responding to me. Competition and Contracting Act requires me to treat them all the same way. If I'm treating them all the same way, that means um, one of them might be a Boeing that has a CA already set up with uh, an infrastructure and trusted organizations. The other one might be Mary and Tom Software Company who has a great product and could provide me a very good service, but doesn't want to have anything to do with the CA stuff, so they want to outsource. They want to go to Verisign. I've got another couple group of organizations in there that, that are 250 pe people or so and, and have a good infrastructure and smart IT people, so they say, we're going to be our own CA. We've got to go out and verify that they are really doing business the right way and, and that they're not getting two certificates and passing them around the office to anybody who needs to use them. And that's critical for us to understand if we're actually going to really get into the trust relationship that needs to happen and make this thing work properly. There is a significant amount of commercial interest here. The banks are analyzing this thing. Um, this is their livelihood. They view a couple hundred billion dollars of electronic commerce and the internet uh, they think is out there to be tapped. Uh, but the way they do it right now is, is very private networks, what's called the automated clearinghouse system. And uh, the analysis that's happening is called the not just the National Automated Clearing House Association study that's actually looking at this. They have six commercially available products they're beating on, testing to see if they're interoperable, testing to see if they can poke holes in them. The insurance company is also very, very interested in this because there's some significant gains to be made out of that, signing claims, um, doing a bunch of other <clears throat> processes within the insurance organization. And you can parlay this into several other uh, commercially, um, commercial special interest groups or commercial groups of people that could use this type of technology. It's very, it's, it, it's very large. There is a very large electronic commerce market that industry is really looking at that. How do we think we can use it? Within Navy, um, at least right now, in the pilots we're standing up. We can use it for travel. We can use it to secure email, um, secure web, medical, dental, pass medical, dental information. Contracting and acquisitions, biologistics, legal, personnel, security, others. What are the issues? I think I've really probably only scratched the surface on um, 
uh, the complexity of some of these issues, um, but there is there is a set. There is a maturity issue. It is, a, like I said, up front, emerging vice emerge technology. You have to look at directory compatibility. I didn't talk uh, talk at all about that, but you have to look at the directory compatibility on where you're storing this type of information and, and how you're actually accessing that and, and what type of directory structure you want to set up is actually you know, that that's a, could be a fairly large issue. Certificate composition, whether it's an identity certificate alone or whether you're actually going to put access control type things into the certificate. The question we have to ask, we have to ask the people that are, are saying they really need this technology brought to bear is what's driving you, the collective you, to set up or need this information at your command now? And I think what, what really brings on that argument is people say, well, we've been doing it this way for a long time. Why, why do I need public key infrastructure now? The environment's changed. The environment has changed significantly in the last five, seven years. The number of computer users you have, network connections we have, collectively, is significantly greater. So our environment's changed. And that's, dry, that's a lot of what's driving our defense in-depth strategy for protecting information on DI. And that's what's driving the public key, the interest in the public key infrastructure. I talked up front about the person sending is who they say they are, the person receiving, um, that the data hasn't been tampered with, and that documents can be digitally signed with non-repudiation. Why is PKI a solution to provide that? At least a commercially available product is reasonable. There's, there's reasonable assurance. There's reasonable risk. Um, it's relatively cheap, and it's it's very sustainable. Because industry is going to it's going to continue to progress with industry, and industry is going to make sure it keeps up with uh, technology. Conclusion: Spoofing an individual on. Inter or intranets is not hard to do. I don't think anybody would refute that uh, that technology exists and it is relatively easy if you want to be malicious about it. Um, this is an emerging technology where we can leverage off what industry's done, take advantage of another layer in the, in the layer of defense. Um, risk management. How much how much of a risk is it to put your information out there or continue to not protect your information on inter and intranets? There's risk associated with that. And there's also uh, a cost associated with doing a greater level of protection. So there's a cost-benefit analysis. That's one of the things that um, we don't have right now is a, is a good cost-benefit analysis or business case analysis of um, what a commercially available product would cost the whole thing versus what a high-level insurance or Proteza-based product would cost. The key is to create trust. Do you trust when you sit on your machine? And it's easy for me for you to call up a hotel and say, "Here's my credit card on the phone." But how comfortable are you typing that credit card number into a and say, "Well, I'm protected with public key infrastructure." And so I'm going to just say, "Well, launch that on the internet." say, here, hotel, here's my credit card. So if you don't create that trust, then you know, there's, some, there's some concern about uh, whether it's actually going to be used. has great potential for DOD in, in the commercial sector. And, and time will tell how much we actually end. True objective is to get an interoperable system that operates both with high assurance, medium or moderate assurance, and that all the end users can utilized to protect their information. Should the subject of group's questions, um, that concludes my brief. Um, what type of thesis work would you like to see in the postgraduate school or the students pursuing this area? Cynthia's <laughs> asked me uh, same, that's, that same question. I, I, don't, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but I will get back to you. I, you know, I can't give you specifics on this, these are, um, this small chunk of information is what we specifically need now. I can tell you right now, um, if, if I were to take, and here's a, a couple ideas. The business case is a, a, a big one. It's not a 
a very technically steeped computer science type thesis. But there is a significant amount of work that needs to be done on, on how, from a management perspective, a computer management perspective, on uh, the differences, the risk management, um, the fundamental differences between medium and, medium and high or moderate high level of assurance in public key infrastructures. From the technical side, if, if NATO and the other services implement an X.400 messaging solution and the Navy decides to go with a, um, a commercial off-the-shelf product, those two are not compatible. If one uses what's called a P772 message format, the other one uses a P4 or a P42 message format, how would I make those two compatible? That's another thought on this too. Um, because, uh, and, and, if, and if that becomes too hard, or is not doable. First of all, there's no commercially available box because the commercial sector doesn't care about X.400 DOD message. They've, they've gone away from that. They really have. They, uh, there's plenty of folks at uh, conferences I've been to that the uh, commercial sector stand up and said X.400 is dead. But we're continuing down that path, at least for right now, as, as the way we're going to do organizational messaging, as well as NATO and Alex. That's the way they're going to do so um, that message format is not compatible with the commercially available product here. So how, do we, how do we make that happen? Is it a multifunction interpreter type box that I put at a NICTAMS or a step site that would allow that to happen? You, know, you, you run that through a gateway and your gateway does your translation for you. Because the commercially available solution is significantly cheaper. So it doesn't provide you the level of assurance. from a risk perspective, and how much is that worth to you in dollars? I have a question about the local registration authority. Okay. Uh, this may be kind of a, a management uh, area mm -hmm. also. Uh, the, has anyone investigated the amount of paperwork and organizational infrastructure required just to register the users? Uh, it's not probably as complicated as getting a, a clearance, um, but it's m more maybe like driver's licenses or something. What is going to be required of each command to make that happen, or each unit that, that would be in LRM in terms of, of infrastructure support? Just in LRM? Right, if you take it one step farther, is there any type of concept of operations to, to uh, manage or uh, control that, that functionality? And it seems like that might be an area where you could write a thesis, uh, propose a, ma a management infrastructure, a method of managing those uh, uh, between different agencies. I can I can tell you there is conops. There's conops at the DoD level. Um, there's conops at the Navy level. Uh, there is standard operating procedures for LRAs and RAs. So that already exists. Where we're lacking is experience in actually implementing. Um, yes, we have SOPs, and just like any uh, fledgling process to a certain extent, when, when you're first starting up, you, you think you understand how it's going to work. But there is no commercial model or experience on a large scale in this right now, nor is there any DOD um, experience. We have our own ideas, we have our own procedures based on the way we think it's going to work, both at the DOD and the Navy level. Uh, but uh, there's drafts stamped across the top of them for a reason, because we don't have a lot of experience. Not even, not even like looking at VeriSign or somebody? VeriSign right now manages um, 2 million certificates total across all of their business partners. It's really small. DOD will be 2 million certificates by itself. Navy will be about 500,000 by itself. So the, the largest company that does this from an outsourcing perspective is in total not as big as DOD will be. That's how small, I mean that's how infant, I mean we're really in the infant stages of this. Well, we really are. Verisline is um, a way of doing business. It's just not, at least for right now, the way DOD has gone. Dr. Hamry did specifically specify, though, in his memos 
that we should evaluate all of the outsourcing possibilities. Well, I don't mean to outsource. I mean just look at how they are managing yeah. this thing. They're, well, and there's um, twice what? Yeah, there's there's a concern. Um, they've got about a hundred people right now managing about two million certificates. How are you evaluating those outsourcing opportunities? I'm not. This is. Um, how is this evaluated? Um, right now, they're not. They haven't even started. And, and here's, their, here's their logic or their reason. They want to make themselves smart first before they feel that they can technically analyze or evaluate outsourcing alternatives. Sounds like another thesis potential area. It's possible. That's correct. Yeah. There's, there's plenty of management things there that, that uh, um, what I've got to get back to Cynthia on are the, are the tech a lot of the hardcore technical issues. There, there is management topics there. That, that, yeah. mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more, um, can we take a minute or two, about these um, pilot projects. Are these pilot projects going to tell us something about how, how this stuff really works? We hope. We hope. One of the things we find... What part of the time frame so have they started? Yes. Um, I can, I can speak at some of that. Uh, NCTS Pensacola decided they looked at this and they said, there's no way I want to be in the CA process. And they outsourced their solely to Verisign. So that's, if you want to call it a pilot, but that's a data point. Um, it's a data point. And, and they're very happy with the, the, uh, the product that Verisign's given. The problem that we collectively have with Verisign is there's three levels of uh, certificates in Verisign. One of them you can get with from any, anybody, you can mail in a copy of a driver's license and they'll send you back a certificate. Uh, the, the next layer is a little bit more scrutiny. The third layer is you have to present before a notary, get a notary stamp, and send it registered. So that's a little bit uh, greater level. DOD's decided not to go that way. DOD's decided to sign a contract with Netscape and um, go down that path, at least for right now. There is no known organized pilots in Army or Air Force. There might be some pockets that are happening, but the groups that represent those organizations at DOD working groups are saying, we're waiting to see what shakes out of the defense travel system pot. So the defense travel system is a pilot that is focused at digital signatures, the ability to digitally sign travel vouchers. Where is that? Where that is myopic is, the other side of this is encryption. What are you going to use encryption predominantly for? Mostly email, email applications. The problem with email and email applications right now is the preponderance of your mail packages are not what's called CERT aware. They're not, they cannot recognize 509B3 certificates. So if I was to take my CC mail package or my Outlook 97 mail package, which I have sitting on my desk at, at, at the office, and try to do this process with it, it, it would fold. It would not recognize it. Now, Outlook 98 is a different story. Microsoft saw the writing on the wall and said, hey, this is something that we really need to get on board with. And so now their Outlook 98 product will recognize a 509B3 certificate and allow you to uh, encrypt and digitally sign. But Microsoft isn't the only one that didn't recognize this as something that was forthcoming. A lot of the mail packages out there don't have it. So that's going to be a problem, and that's one of the things where we're hoping to come out of this pilot. Several other things we're hoping to come out of the pilots, and that is what other applications are out there and, and what type of uh, modification uh, will be required to do um, to make them 509B3 certain where. Where are the projects at? Spaywar has stood up uh, a CA of their own. We have um, secured our, uh, our servers. We have SSL up and running. We need to get, uh, right now we can send email in a convoluted fashion. If you go into IE, Internet Explorer, and then you can get into Outlook Express, and Outlook Express is sort of where, where you can send Netscape to Netscape, to, to Netscape pure clients, you can send email that way. So we have the ability to do that today at Spaywar, and we're working on getting the other mail packages up. We're also looking at the travel system that we're implementing and doing signing Nav Air has basically done the same thing, and 
NAFS up. Uh, I have some feelers out to try to figure out exactly what they're doing. They have what's called the One Touch Supply System up. And they're claiming that they're using PKI to protect that One Touch Supply System. I think they're doing it at, at the SSL uh, level. I don't think they're doing anything beyond the SSL level. Uh, but I don't know the answer to that. So that's where the projects are. Um, we're the only ones that are trying to solve the email problem right now because we think that's the biggest problem. So how many people does that involve? Right now, the Spayware pilot has about uh, 50 to 100 people. And as soon as we figure out this email thing, we'll, we'll grow it very rapidly to about 500. And then it will grow significantly after that because it'll go to all the field activities. And once it hits all of our field activities, you end up with about 5,000 people with a fairly rapidly. And that's hopefully by the beginning of summer. And then you fold in different applications, you start folding in other people, external 